Can you fix me? Take it. SNL is the highest mountain I have ever had to climb. But it is so much fun climbing. Chris, we're in the center of this. All right, here we go. Stand by, folks. I'm Don Roy King. I'm the director of Saturday Night Live. Big one. I have an 18-year-old daughter who keeps me young and relatively hip. It's like a really cool thing that he does, and it's really interesting that the thing that he does is cool in my demographic, in my age. Just by definition, I'm more exposed to things I wouldn't be otherwise, and that forces me to stay in touch. Oh. Hey, we're at Seth Myers, and here are tonight's top stories. We get our news the same way. And I think that it's really nice that he is up to date in that way, and we can talk about weird pop culture modern stuff. <laughs> and we bring in music acts who are top and latest hit makers who I normally would have lost touch with a long time ago. But you still have a little bit of like culture shock sometimes. Like um, Two Chains was a musical guest one time, and he came home um, from the first day that he met Two Chains and was surprised there was only one person <laughs> wearing the other chain. <laughs> And like he doesn't even get starstruck that way, you know? He's just like, oh, there's my buddy now, you know, I worked with this guy, and that's just the situation. And you sometimes would be like, but do you know who that is? Like, do you understand how like amazed you should be? It is so much fun to be here. And I develop a much broader eclectic interest in music. <laughs> Guys, I want to move his chair a little bit. I think that a lot of what he does requires different styles of directing and knowledge of a lot of things. For 21 years, I directed morning television at Good Morning America and then CBS This Morning. I was in my mid-50s, and I thought, I've got to change this lifestyle. CBS agreed, and I moved on. But as I stepped out the door, I thought, now what? I still have skills to offer, I still have bills to be paid, and I still have a desire to find something challenging and definitive. And then I get an opportunity, kind of out of nowhere, to direct Saturday Night Live. It was sort of a left turn in my career, and the need to learn a new skill set, to work with comedians, to stage, sketch comedy, and there were moments when I thought, I really don't know what I'm doing here, and I hate that feeling. And I haven't had those butterflies since I was 20. I thought, oh, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to risk failure. But then I thought, yeah, there's also a chance that I'll come out on the other end of it, where those butterflies turn into the flutter of excitement and pride and the exhilaration of success. I emerged with the most exciting job I could possibly imagine. And I'm so glad I took that risk. I have so much respect for my father and what he does and who he is. My daughter Cameron, whom I adore. And so when I'm that age, I hope to have the same attitude that he does. And that is, you know, to live life to the fullest and to not give up. If I had been given this show 20 years ago, I wouldn't have had the temperament to I would have been too defensive. Wait, who are you again, Wings? <laughs> Saturday Night Live is the perfect show for me. World 31, take it. At the perfect time in my life. Applause. <laughs> nice job, folks. <laughs> this crew is following me around. And there's a little bit of a rumor that I might be the next bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> Distinction 
of directing more hours of live network television in the history of the media. There was a, a, a woman who went to a, to a reunion like this at, at her high school, and it was all different, different years. And uh, she looked at the check-in the check table, and there was a man there with a cane, and, 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 and he was hobbling along, clearly, uh, in pain, white, straggly hair. That's so where it is. Uh, in the meantime, it saw 1969 on it. She said, oh my God, that was my year. She looked a little closer, she looked at the name, she said, Deke Jones. He was the captain of the football team. He was the class stud. <laughs> and then she saw two people kind of help him over to, to sit down in the chair, and she finally got to the nurse. She said, maybe I can make him feel better. Walked over and reached down, shook his hand, said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Cheryl Williams. I was, I was here when, when you were. Just, he looked up at her and said, really? What did you teach? <laughs> I haven't had a reason to jump since 1982. <laughs> I, I go into a supermarket. I say, excuse me, do you work here? Can you get that down for me? I'm fine. No, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk about Saturday Night Live. Um, the last time I did one of these, my, 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 my family knows, uh, the first question that was asked, a woman raised her hand and said, um, I've been trying to get into the comedy business for years. Is it true that everybody in comedy is bipolar. <laughs> I said, well, the answer to that is yes and no. <laughs> so I'm a little gun shy of taking audience questions. So I decided to write the questions myself. Oh, here's a good one. Does Saturday Night Live play a role in our national consciousness? Does it serve one political viewpoint over another? Is it an effective tool in holding our leaders accountable? I have no idea. <laughs> what is Lauren Michaels like? Lauren is uh, cool and distant and occasionally nasty and non-communicative and brilliant. The, the most remarkable man I've ever worked with, and he is the reason that Saturday Night Live has been on the air for 42 years. He's the reason it continues to test the waters and push the envelope and, 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 and stay current. And uh, right now, I think providing a service that is healing and uh, revealing and, and, and important. And I could not be happier uh, being a part of that team. What's it like to work with Kanye West? Well, I wasn't expecting that question. That's a tough one. Uh, I will tell one story that, that I. Uh, Kanye uh, started a new fashion line 
uh, and he had a big fashion show at Bryant Park in, in, in New York. And the next day, he showed up for rehearsal because he was a musical guest that week. And he walked into the studio and he saw my sweater. I just got into some sweater in American Apparel and some kind of unusual design on it. He said, that is a dope sweater, dude. <laughs> I jokingly said, yeah, well, it comes from the Kanye West line. <laughs> he said, it will soon. <laughs> he called his assistant over to take a picture of my sweater. <laughs> so I look, look for it. Oh, here's my story about, this is a, who is your favorite musical guest? It includes my story about uh, two chains. Uh, my uh, daughter made a fool of me. <laughs> of course, she, she and my and niece, Caitlin, ended up being the stars of that video. I, and I, um, I thought it was, I thought there were two chains. <laughs> How do I get tickets to SNL? <laughs> Who had that question? Yeah, I tried that. Well, we are about to enter our 43rd season, and, uh, and I am surprised and proud to say it's still the hottest ticket in town. Uh, I get two tickets for every show, and I donate most of them to schools and charities. And a few years ago, I donated them to my daughter's uh, uh, high school for uh, their fundraiser. And on that same that same auction lot were two tickets to Hamilton. The Saturday Night Live tickets drew twice as much money as a Hamilton. <laughs> Is it true you took off your shirt during the final staff read through of the season with Dwayne the Rock Johnson in the room? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you have any advice for someone who is considering a broadcasting career? Uh, my advice is, don't take advice from me. In 1981, I was hired to fly to L.A. and uh, direct the pilot of a show called Entertainment Tonight. And I went there and spent a month of sort of patching together this flashy pseudo news show with flashy graphics and music. and. Um, flew back to New York. A month later they called and said, uh, the show has sold. We would love for you to move out here and direct it. And I stopped and I thought, wait, this is a half hour show, six days a week, mm -hmm. and the stories are nothing but show business stories? How long can that show last? <laughs> What's the best part of your job? That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> Seeing larger than life uh, icons, uh, movie actors, uh, television personalities, uh, athletes, uh, stars of any world, rappers, uh, out of their comfort zone. It is uh, an amazingly scary, challenging three days for the hosts of that show. They're in almost every sketch. And they've never done, most of them have never done sketch comedy. Where they've got to take characters and wear dresses and wigs and, and, and put on a show. Uh, and to see how they handle that uh, rather intense period of time is uh, it, it's kind of thrilling. And to know that I'm sort of the one that has to hold their hand through it uh, uh, makes for a, a rather remarkable and lightning experience uh, seeing how the uh, idols uh, sprint through or have clay feet and uh, most of them remarkably are there to do what they can to give it a shot not all of them are good at it but most of them try uh, and it's been thrilling to watch and thrilling to, to, to be a part of uh, and, and it relates to the next question which is um, who's your favorite host uh, it's a story I've told a lot and, 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 and enjoy it because it is enlightening on several levels, I think. My first year, 2006, the fifth show we did was hosted by Alec Baldwin. 
Now, Al Aitken has done it more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. He is brilliant at it, and the cast and crew uh, love working with him, certainly the writers, uh, because he can do impressions, he can mm -hmm. sleep from character to character, he's got great comedic time, and he knows how to do it. Uh, and people afterwards said, well, Don, that's certainly the best show you've done so far. And, uh, it was smooth. But there was sort of a cloud over the whole operation related to the next week because the host and musical guest doing both roles was a guy named Chris Bridges, also known as the rapper Ludicrous. Mm. Now, I didn't know much about it. I did know that he certainly had no acting experience or comedy experience, and he was a 23-year-old kid who already been in a big national argument with Oprah about the nature of his lyrics. And, uh, but I could tell that everyone else thought, man, this kid may come in with a chip on his shoulder and probably an entourage, and it could be a tough week. Well, the weeks are compressed. Uh, we meet the host on Monday, and when we met him, and we just had a short meeting to throw out ideas, he was very quiet, and, and, and he's like, semi-shy and no chip in his shoulder, but it was a, there was some hesitance. Uh, on what Tuesday, the writers write all night. We do nothing, or the host does nothing. Wednesday, we have a read-through where we read all the scripts that have been submitted, as many as 40 scripts. And he read fine, but he didn't bring anything to any of the characters. He just he, he read through it, which often happens. Thursday, we rehearsed the first sketches, the easy sketches. Well, that's after we rehearsed music. Well, we rehearsed his, his songs, and they were relatively tasteful and, and simple, and, and then he knows how to do that. But the first sketch, uh, I rehearsed out on the floor to block the actors, and, uh, and the first sketch was a talk show where uh, his character appeared late in the sketch, and uh, there's a semicircle of the rest of the cast. Uh, they, were, they started off, and they were already bouncing off the walls with amazing characters and making the crew laugh, and it was clearly uh, a typical uh, SNL rehearsal. But I looked over at Chris, and he's sitting there with his script, and the script was shaking. And I thought, whoa, man, we're, we're in trouble. This, this kid might be on something. But so finally circled around his first line, and that deep baritone voice of his came out with a little quiver in it. And I thought, wait a minute, he's not on something. He's nervous. <laughs> Oh, I'd be nervous. So who wouldn't be nervous? You're sitting there with the best sketch actors in the world. You've never done this before. You've got to come up with some line reading for a, for a, a, for a, for a, a script. And I, I suddenly thought, oh, man, this, this no wonder he, he, he's a little shy and shaky and quiet. Well, for the next two and a half days, he worked harder than any host we have ever had. He was the first one on set. He'd say up a night, written questions down, ask me if he could try an accent, or if I, can, I, can I move over here, and, and is that, is that, does that work at all? And, oh, he, he, he worked hard. There certainly was no entourage, and uh, the only attitude was, I want to I make this work somehow. But it's not a very forgiving system to a late starter, and you know, right after that is Saturday, and suddenly we're in dress rehearsal, we're in front of a live audience, and, he struggled a little, little bit through, through dress rehearsal, and, and I, I thought, well, I'm the director, maybe I can help. And so the dress rehearsal ends, I jump up out of the control room, walk out into the hallway and stop him as he comes out of the studio. And uh, I say, hey, Chris, i got to tell you something. I've only done five of these, but man, you have impressed me. You've come so far in just, just two and a half days. I looked up and down the hall to see if anybody else was around. And he kind of grabbed me by the lapels and sort of pushed me against the wall. And he said, <laughs> Thank you so much for telling me that. <laughs> so I had no idea what I was getting myself into. This is so hard. <laughs> but if I hear enough from the director, it helps him. Oh, oh, okay. Well, he went on and did, I think, a remarkable show. He improved so much in just that one hour between the dress rehearsal and, and the air show. And uh, in fact, he did some things that were remarkable. He did one sketch with, with uh, Daryl Hammond that I think should be in the archives. It, it was late in the show. It was kind of a, a, an esoteric, quiet piece about two old men reflecting on life. Oh, it was good. So after the show, I got up and went into his dressing room to, to congratulate him. And, not, and not, now the room was filled with his entourage, and, and, and they were celebrating. And, uh, but he saw me and pushed his way through his friends, came over and shook my hand and said, thank you so much for talking to me between shows. I said, oh, you don't have to thank me. You, you proved me right. That was great. He got quiet again. He said, hey, 
go tell my mom that, will you? <laughs> Okay, questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Now let me go back. And... What is your favorite Muhammad Ali story? Well, somebody here thought I was Don King of Boxing for a minute. <laughs> That's why he's Don Roy King. It's been a problem for me ever since he got out of jail in 1971. <laughs> Oh, but I do have a Muhammad Ali story. Um, when I was directing Good Morning America, um, I, I, I had sort of taken up boxing as a, a pastime. When other people take up golf, I took up boxing. Uh, and, and I learned from a great guy. I, I, I competed a little bit as an amateur boxer. Uh, but as a result, I was sort of a celebrity in Good Morning America just for having done something stupid. Uh, but David Hartman, the host of, of, Saturday, of, of Good Morning America, was a big boxing fan, and uh, and we would occasionally cover big fights, uh, and, and just give David and me uh, an excuse to, to go see them. Uh, so we covered Muhammad Ali's last fight. Mm. He was old and, and downhill and struggling, uh, and his last fight was in the Bahamas against a guy named Trevor Burger. Uh, and he lost badly. But he had agreed to uh, an interview with David Hartman the morning after the fight. Well, that shows on the air at 7 in the morning, and David and I were up at 6 and walked over to the hotel where, where we were hoping that, that he would show, thinking maybe not. Uh, number one, he was probably physically in pain. Number two, he had been kind of humiliated in the ring, and number three, we thought it probably was his last fight, and he didn't want to talk about it the next morning. But as we turned the corner into the lobby, there he was, sitting on a chair waiting for us. And, and he had sunglasses on, but you could tell under this eye was badly swollen, like this whole side was sort of swollen, and big mouse under, under this eye. But, uh, and he was slumped over the chair in, in pain. Uh, David walked up and shook his hand, introduced me, and said, uh, my director, Don, in fact, Don does a little boxing himself. He's, uh, he's, a, he's an amateur boxer. Uh, oh. <laughs> 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 I'm more about that. But Muhammad Ali took off his sunglasses, looked at me, and said, let's see what you got. Held up his hand like this for me to throw a jab. And I threw a jab and smacked him in, in, in that hand. He said, you keep it up, son. That's not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> what was your weight class? <laughs> uh, My first job was right here. I worked at uh, WPSX then, it's now WPSU. Seems like better call letters. <laughs> uh, and it was a black and white station. I am very proud of that, that I started in black and white. And this may be the only audi audience I'll ever talk to who knows what black and white television is. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, went to a small UHF station in San Jose, California for eight or nine months, and then went to uh, KDKA. But KDKA, uh, that happened because of this. Uh, while at Penn State, I had an internship uh, at, for 10 weeks in the summer at KDKA. It was the best internship imaginable. Every week, we were in a different department, and because, Penn, because KDKA was a, was a 
um, unionized station, there were some restrictions, but not much. And they let me write spots for the week I was in radio. When I was in television news, uh, they ran out of reporters one day, and they sent me out with a camera crew to cover a story. It was fabulous. I got to learn a little bit about uh, how uh, stations work in the, in the traffic department and, and, uh, and, and the business side of it. It was, it, it was the only week, week I was assigned to uh, television promotion. And they were doing publicity spots for the new fall season. They had written little jingles and hired uh, Pittsburgh dancers to go out and perform these jingles about the new shows that were coming up in the, in, in the fall. And they were going to take them out into Pittsburgh landmarks. To, to, and uh, the, the day before the production was to begin, they said to the people in the office, anybody here drive a stick ship? <laughs> and I raised my hand. They said, well, great, because we rented a camper to be sort of the traveling dressing room for dancers. So I spent that week driving this camper around and carrying coats to dancers, and it felt like I kind of wasted my time. But at the end of the internship, I said to them, uh, what, um, I, I would love to work here someday. What's your advice? And they said, well, get some experience at some smaller stations and then give us a call. So I spent a year at WPS. X, I spent eight months in San Jose, and I called up KDKA. And I said, I got that experience. I would love to come back and work for you. And they said, Don King, can't place you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got a lot of interns come through here. And I, I, don't care. I said, well, I was the guy who wrote all those radio spots by myself, and an intern wrote for me. He said, nah, sorry. I said, I covered a news story once for a news for, I, I went out, out, out with a crew and covered a robbery out the south side. He said, no, no, I'm sorry. Don King. Wait a minute, you the guy that drove the stick ship? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, you were great at that. We have a job for you. Come back here, it's a summer job, you're going to produce pirate baseball. How cool was that? And uh, that led to a full-time job as a producer and director and writer, and I got, it was probably the biggest career move I made. It allowed me to, uh, to, to work on some remarkable stuff and develop skills as a live director, and I did documentaries, and I did a weekly magazine show for a while, directed telethons, and it, it was probably the core of my tool belt of, uh, of skills. And the uh, uh, next thing I knew, I was in New York. Don, did you, did, you have a, did you have a car in New York? Oh, man, I knew you were. <laughs> <laughs> I spent uh, 3 years directing the Mike Douglas show in Philadelphia. Once again, this is the only audience that remembers the Mike Douglas show. <laughs> Thank you. For a while, for a while people would say, "Oh, Michael Douglas, the actor had a, had a talk show." I said, "No, it was before that." But now people don't even know who Michael Douglas was. So they've forgotten him too. But I, 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 I digress. So, uh, so the, the, these three years directing the Mike Douglas show, it was, it was a big jump too. It was a national syndicated talk show, sort of the Ellen of its time. And uh, I, was, I was a director, skilled member now, and making a lot more money than I ever made before. And uh, a couple years in, I said, I'm going to splurge. And I bought a little Mercedes two-seater Mercedes uh, convertible, 450 SL. Whoa, that was a slick car. And two weeks later, Mike decided to move the show to LA. Oh. <laughs> well, I lived in New York, and I knew I didn't need a car. Well, I'm going to put into this Mercedes. I, I got a job by directing a show called America Alive in, in, in New York, uh, and I moved back to New York, and I had this little Mercedes, and I put it in a garage around the corner from my apartment, and the Garage costs a little more than apartments cost now, you know, just, just to rent that garage. Uh, but, and I felt guilty about it, so every weekend I'd drive it around a little bit and just to, you know, put it back in the garage. <coughs> After a month or so, I thought, this is stupid. I'm, gonna, I, I'm just going to let that car sit there because it's sort of an insurance policy. It, it increases in value, and eventually I might need the money. I'll cash it in as an insurance policy. Well, the show only lasted six months. America Live was not alive long. And I said, I better, I better raise some money. I'll get rid of that car. So I walked out oh, around the corner to the garage, and I said to the attendant, I said, I know you've never seen me before, but I'm the guy that owns that Mercedes in slot 66. He said, well, I've been here 
six months, and there's never been a car in spot 66. The <laughs> <laughs> car had been stolen at least six months before. <laughs> <laughs> no insurance. I don't think insurance laughs. I didn't need, didn't, need, didn't need insurance. I went to the police station. I said, my, I, I, my car was stolen out of a parking garage. They said, well, what time did you park it? I said, uh, what month is it? <laughs> That's why I don't take questions from the audience. <laughs> yes, sir. I have great respect for talk show hosts, and um, uh, although I, I, I met Johnny Carson but never worked with him before, uh, I, I see in him just, uh, just the brilliance of what it takes to do that kind of show. But Mike, in, in a similar way, had an unusual, it's, it's a, there's a dichotomy in, in being a good talk show host. You have your name at the top of the show, it is the Mike Douglas show. And that whole show exists just because people like you and people tune in to see you. And that whole operation, the hundreds of people who work for the Mike Douglas show work because of you. So you have to have a sense of, of who you are and, 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 and be comfortable in being the, the name above the title. But you also, and certainly in Mike's case, have to understand that you've got to share the spotlight with your guests. And Mike was brilliant at that. He loved it when someone would come on the show and, and get a big laugh. It wasn't competitive about that at all. He knew instinctively that that would reflect positively on him. But it wasn't competitive in the sense of, well, well wait a minute, you just said something funnier than I said. He loved that. And when somebody would sing a song that he sang last week, sing it better, and he knew he, 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 it was fun. He just <coughs> gave him joy to, to, to share the stage and give a platform for, for other other. Uh, other performers, and uh, that's rare. It's, it's a lot more rare than you think. Uh, but he, um, he was successful, I think, because of that. Yes? How did you avoid, how did you avoid having Lauren make you a star of the show? That's what I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you didn't phrase that right. You, you meant, yeah. how could you make Lauren? <laughs> <laughs> The first director, uh, David Wilson, directed for 20 years of the show, uh, and he occasionally, they do little sketches where uh, somebody would walk into the control room, and then he would stand it up and have a little dialogue with the, with the host of the show. And I'm still waiting for that to happen. Well, he's missing the boat. Uh, well, uh, all right, thank you. You, you want one's address, huh? Yes, sir. How has the I have two hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll make it short then. Uh, not at all. It has affected my life in, in, in only the slimmest ways. Uh, whether it's a show about, whether it's a sketch about uh, what happened in the White House yesterday, or it's a sketch about fart jokes, I am uh, responsible for kind of the same thing. Getting that material up and properly designed and shot in a way that sells the material to the people at home in the most unobtrusive way possible and the most direct way possible without in interfering with the comedy, without interfering with the message. Uh, so the answer, that, that, that's the, 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 the uh, smug answer to, to, to your question. The real answer, though, is that I feel like we are more important than ever and doing something valuable and uh, holding people accountable and in some ways healing uh, in the way we treat important uh, and serious matters with a little edge, a little humor, and, uh, and occasionally cross the line, occasionally offend, uh, occasionally go too far, but more often than not, enlighten and amuse.
it's the most remarkable group I've ever worked with. By far, uh, uh, just the best at what they do. And it starts with probably <laughs> a, a hundred core people, uh, and then expands through the week. Uh, the production weeks, as I mentioned, are, are intense and, and, and truncated. Uh, but by, by Saturday night, they're probably 250s who are doing something for the show uh, as we're on, uh, while we're on the air by. But they just sort of take care of things on their own. Uh, as I said, we do a read through on Wednesday. Lauren does not select the material that we're actually going to mount until Wednesday evening. And I take those scripts that have been selected for the first time, turn them over in another room to the designers and the set designers and the hair and makeup people and the wardrobe people and the special effects people mm -hmm. find out what we're going to mount Wednesday night. And we're talking about 12 one-act plays from scratch. And it just sort of happens. And, and, and I, I walk in on Saturday and look around at the sets and I say, this, this set looks exactly like a high school in Chicago. And who found that clock? And who hung that clock? And, who painted the floor? Who found these 15 desks? And, but it just happens. It's just hmm. brilliant people. It's one of the reasons uh, there's very little turnover. turnover. Uh, it's the last show of its kind, and people who are mm -hmm. good at it and fast at it sort of stick with the show. Mm -hmm. It's thrilling to be there. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been with the show for many years now, and um, what do you personally, you and Laura Michaels, what do you look for in uh, particularly young cast members and new cast? Are you a potential like young cast member? That's right. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, once again, my answer is short. It is I don't know. Uh, I do know that there, the vetting process is intense. There's a whole talent department that, that goes out across the country and goes to improv clubs and comedy clubs and, and theaters to uh, watch performers. Uh, we get lots of submissions, lots of submissions of tapes of uh, reels of people who show what they can do or what characters they have or what impressions they've got tucked away. And then that vetting process narrows it down uh, to uh, as many as 20 people who might audition uh, once a year, maybe twice a year. And they come into Studio 8H and they get five minutes to do their material by themselves. And they, uh, I direct these, but it's just a single camera. And they look right at the camera. And over here is Lauren Michaels and the producer and, and the staff of writers. Not the best audience in the world. You're not getting many laughs from them. You just look at your camera, you do your five minutes, and your life may or may not change. Probably won't. Out of those 25 people we audition, sometimes none. Sometimes we'll pick up one, sometimes we'll pick up two, but it's rare. And it's kind of heartbreaking because I know what that means for those kids, and I know how talented they are, and how many people have told them over the lot, "Man, you you should be on Saturday Night Live." And they honed those skills, and they worked on characters, and they uh, written sketches, and they have worked in comedy clubs and done that work over and over again. And when they got that audition, they worked that material at five minutes, a thousand. 10,000 times and done it in front of their friends and family and now they're here in front of Lauren and nobody laughs and it's over and they walk out and never hear. Uh, oh, that was, that depressed me. <laughs> and I even, even then, the, the couple who, there's, those who get picked up, uh, Lauren himself says that you really don't know whether uh, an actor can make it until a after at least a year. Uh, and that's because you find out whether they, can, they have the flexibility to slide into a lot of different roles quickly. To find out if they've got characters that can repeat. Find out if there are writers who are, can write for them. Mm -hmm. and they end up, and, and all of the cast members write as well. Some better than others, but, but those who are weaker end up trying to hook on to to the, the, the writing staff or a writing team to uh, churn out stuff for them. And then they go on that first time, give their best shot, maybe a character they worked on for 30 years or, or, a, or they've been a story they've, they've told and developed into a sketch and it might make it to air. If it does, uh, maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. And then I've seen a lot disappear after one year. That's painful too. 
You try, to, Sorry. you try to help Penn Staters and our musical theater program in any way you can? It's, in, it's the best musical theater department in the government. Yeah, okay. And uh, when I was here, I spent most of my time in the theater department. I became a broadcasting major just because I could be close to the theater department without telling my dad I was an acting major. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was my love and my passion at Penn State, and it was a fine theater department, but it has gotten much, much better. I do have a little bit of sad news relating to the uh, theater department at Penn State. My daughter goes to Michigan. Oh. <laughs> How about transferring? I tried that too. She was accepted into a three-person directing program. And one of the other kids accepted is named Harbaugh, the coach's son. So the, the, the competition was sweet. She got in. She's thriving there, but she belongs at Penn State. Grad school. Grad school. Yeah. Um, this may be a tough question to answer. Uh, are there two skits to stand out and put on the air that you regret? Oh, regret. Oh, yeah. Okay, I mean, you threw that in there. Stand out. And are there one or two that end up on the cutting room floor that you really regret and never saw like that? And that's probably the harder one. How many have you seen? <laughs> well, you're right. That was a tough question to answer. Next. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no, I, um, it, it shocks me every week how much material doesn't make it. And the writers come in, and very similar to what I was talking about, the, the performers. Writers come in with a whole lifetime of experience and, and sketches they've written in high school or college that they mounted and performed and perfected and molded, and, and they put them in their portfolios and they, they get a shot. They get a six month contract at Saturday Night Live, and they come on and say, Well, the one sketch that's going to make my career is this one. This is proven, and it has been front of people and made them laugh and I know this is this is gonna work. And they submit that on Wednesday and we read through those forty sketches and then I'll walk into the uh, walk into Warren's office after he's narrowed it down and over on this side will be thirty of those sketches that never won't even get considered. He's plugged in a few over here into the show and now here are four more and then we're gonna kind of narrow those down and give our opinions about those four. But most of those sketches that had been developed for years and that were true blue and were sure sure things are over right here on this side. And those writers think, now I've got to write something for next week and I, I don't have a lifetime to work on it. I've got six days. And it is uh, painful to, to see that happen. But to answer your question, many of those sketches that do make it only make it the dress rehearsal. We'll go into a dress rehearsal with as much as 20 minutes more material than we need. Hmm. So automatically, two or three will be tossed out and never make it to air. Uh, then we'll go into air, the air show with as much as five or six minutes more material than we need. So during the show, something else will disappear. So sh sketches that have been the soul of, of some of those writers and performers and scene designers and special effects people and, and, and all of the creative arts that went into creating that sketch, those sketches never get seen by anybody. And they almost never come back. Even the ones that get cut, get cut for time on air never come back. Lauren is brilliant at judging how a piece of material will work in front of a live audience. And when in front of that, that dress rehearsal audience, he just knows that this can be fixed, can't be fixed, should work better after weekend update than before, and, uh, and makes changes on the fly. During dress rehearsal, he's got an assistant. He's throwing out changes to that assistant. And at 10.15, after the dress rehearsal ends, I get a whole list of, uh, of his notes that say, uh, don't use a two-shot in that sketch and uh, the, the, I, the lighting sucked in this way. 
and change the wallpaper in this one. Well, we're, we go on the air in an hour, and, and, <laughs> and then I get my script back that has been meticulously noted with every single shot, and it, every what that shot was, and hand it over to the camera operator so they have shot sheets knowing exactly what they're, what they're doing next. I'll turn the page, and the whole page will be crossed out. I'll turn the page, there'll be a new line written in here. Turn the page, this is a different ending. How are we going to do that? I, and every single week, I curse him under my breath as I try quickly to get the camera enough to speed. Kill shots 23, 24, and 26, and make 20, shot 28, camera 2, not ca well, Wait a minute, that's a different ending. Well, oh, no, the sketch, sketch ended there. Forget the rest of the numbers. And then we go on the air, and we fly, and most of the time we land. And uh, I inevitably say, he was right. That sketch was funnier after weekend update, or it worked better with those new lines. He, that, that's, his, that's his brilliance. In addition to being so demanding, and he refuses to coast, he does not want this show to be some old, tired war horse. It's got to stay current. It's got to stay fresh. He demands excellency. And he uh, most of the time gets it. Well, in that vein, we're down to your best stuff. We have five minutes. Uh, okay. Well, I'll, I need the best question then. <laughs> <laughs> the best question. Uh, you were talking about the set changes. Is there anything comparable in other in the industry as far as making all these uh, changes live? Set changes for a show? If you'd asked me 11 years ago, can the show even be done this way? I, I would have said, absolutely not. Nobody would take the risks at a high stakes show to make changes as, as, as often to put together the whole, the whole operation in, in two and a half days, I would say absolutely not. I mean, even in shows like the, the Tonight Show, uh, 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 they do some wild ad-lib freelance stuff, but then they have three hours to edit it and clean it up. I mean, no disrespect to that operation, but they have that extra added advantage. Yes? No. <laughs> I, it's, it, it's good in the sense that when I first started, I thought it's a good thing I'm older. I'll be able to deal with ego issues because I know they, these people are super talented. And they can't do anything, and then I can say, I don't want to rehearse that again, or I better go talk to my agent, or uh, uh, could 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 my sketch be up on the stage instead of that fucking here in the corner? None of that. No, it, it is just I guess number one a fun place to be, and our job is to make people laugh and clap, and, 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 and it's surrounded by brilliant people who enjoy making, telling stories and, and, and creating sketches. Uh, and, and it's also iconic, and it's, we're all proud to be a part of it and to be there. And it's also the, uh, Lauren, I, I said that he hires the best at what they do. Uh, there are therefore some ego issues that are potential and that the lighting designer is, is furious at the scenic designer because it came out in, in the shiny wallpaper and you can't get the light reflections off and that they would really they would really compete at that intense ego level. But if the scenic designer can, can say, that's the way Lauren wants it, that shuts down the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's, his, it's, a, he, it's his vision. And all of these super talented people kind of mold to our job is not to show off. Our job is to fulfill his vision, and, and that's kind of like the, that's kind of the cast attitude too. And that that helps. Yes. I don't know if this is the best question, but for years I have marveled at characters. When you decide, did you decide to have Sarah Palin and then look at? Tina Fey, or did you look at Tina Fey and decide she was Sarah Palin? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I said, she's better than Sean Spicer. <laughs> 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 really, how does that happen? It's <coughs> been it's brilliant. Well, it's brilliant. You may reference it two remarkable women who I have enormous respect for on many levels. Tina had just left the year before, and, uh, uh, I don't know exactly how it happened. I believe Lorne saw Sarah Palin introduced the first time and said, whoa, she looks like Tina. 
Tina, can you do this accent? And <laughs> Tina said, I'm, I'm doing executive producing and starring in 30 Rock. I don't, and I'm raising two kids. I don't have time to, to, uh, to brush my teeth. And, uh, but it was Lauren, and Lauren popped her into it. She was there the next week, and she, uh, she was remarkable. That was a gift from the comedy gods for us. <laughs> uh, I believe it was similar. I, I'm not sure who initiated the contact. I certainly was surprised. I, I thought it's a great idea, but I, I, I'm not sure about how the physical resemblance will happen. That happened. And uh, Melissa is fearless. She will do anything. She is sweetest, sweetest, nicest woman, but cutting edge and fearless. Yes. Say, the question. The question. I'm sorry, the question was uh, how, did, how did Alec Baldwin end up doing Trump? And the um, uh, answer is kind of similar. Uh, Alec is a good friend of Lauren's. I was shocked. We had uh, Daryl Hammond, who was a cast member for years, a brilliant impressionist, had come back just to be the announcer uh, when John Pardo died. But his contract said he wasn't going to do any sketches. Um, I, I'm not sure why that was. Perhaps his agent said it, it'll look like you're, you know, tiptoeing back into the cast, and we want you to be something else and move on in your career. I, I'm not sure, uh, but he, Lauren forced him to do Bill Clinton twice, and forced him to do Trump once or twice when Trump first started the campaign. Uh, I don't know how it happened. My guess is that that Lauren, uh, 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 that the people said. Daryl just can't do that anymore. Uh, and Warren said, oh, i got to find somebody else. And he turned to his buddy. When it was announced, I thought, hey, oh, man, that's such a bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> number one, Daryl was so good at it. He does the best Trump in the world. And number two, uh, Alec, he does a couple of impressions, but not great. And uh, he's going to be hard to get in on a regular basis. And I was wrong. <laughs> so, like, Entertainment tonight. I I miss that one <laughs> because of his remarkable comic timing, because of uh, his notoriety in and of himself, and because of what he developed into a great cartoon. I, uh, it, it sold tickets for us. <laughs> well, we wanted there. You were huge. Yeah. <laughs>